keto diet? Keto. Okay, so <laughs> this is unfortunately overrated at the moment, and the word keto will be dead in a couple more years, for sure. It's already trending down in Google search. And welcome to a new episode of Astrid, your APD. And I have Ted Neyman. He's going to join us and we're going to talk about quite a few things you've been waiting for. And we're going to do a rapid Q&A, overrated, underrated on metabolic health. So stay tuned till the end because this is going to be really, really cool. How would you define metabolic health and how can we make this, uh, our metabolic health as optimal as possible? Got it. Okay, so for me, metabolic health, is the ability to eat anything I want and easily dispose of all those macros, right? Are the really the carbs and the fat macronutrient? So disposing of fat, you uh, you use your fat cells. If your fat cells are you know shrunken down, let's say your fat cells are half full or twenty five percent full, uh, you can eat all the fat you want. Your fat cells just suck it right out of your bloodstream on the first pass. Um, people who are very lean and have small insulin sensitive fat cells, they, their triglycerides are always low. They can eat an oral fat tolerance test, for example, and their triglycerides stay fairly low because the fat cells just suck the triglycerides right out of the bloodstream on the first pass. When you have people who are over fat and they have abdominal obesity, they're insulin resistant, their fat cells are all huge and too full, the triglycerides just circle forever. And you'll see over fat people whose triglycerides are extremely high. And that's basically because they have no place to put fat energy because their fat cells are already too full. Same thing happens with glucose, but in this case, mostly in your muscles. So your muscles are the biggest sink for glucose. It's the biggest place that glucose goes. If you don't have a lot of muscle and you never deplete your muscle glycogen, the muscles typically stay you know, mostly full of glycogen for emergency use. So if you're not depleting it and you're not exercising and you don't have a lot of muscle to begin with, you have very little room to dispose of glucose. You can maybe fit 100 grams in your liver every 24 hours, and that's about it. So you, if your fat cells are full and your muscle cells are full of glycogen because you, you're over fat and you never exercise, then you have horrible metabolic flexibility and you can't dispose of glucose or fat and you eat the two together and you have high triglyceride, you have high glucose. You have a high triglyceride glucose index, which is the product of the two in your bloodstream. And you're just energy toxic and that's the absolute worst case scenario. And that's why all your type two diabetics have sky high triglycerides and sky high glucose all the time. But you take somebody like a, like a bodybuilder who's dieted down and they're super, super lean, tons of lean mass, constantly depleting glycogen, lots of room in their fat cells. They have extreme insulin sensitivity and extreme metabolic flexibility. They could just eat a whole pizza and just whoop, the calories are gone. They can easily dispose of all the glucose and all the fat. And to me, that's what metabolic flexibility really is. So would that metabolic flexibility be the same as metabolic health? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So if you were to say it in a very simple sentence, what metabolic flexibility or metabolic health is, what, what would that be? I would say having plenty of room for energy macronutrient storage and being able to easily dispose of incoming energy macronutrients. Um, would you say that also being able to, um, to see the, your biomarkers or like your blood, your blood work, noticing that there's no issues like you have low triglycerides, uh, no, no high HbA1c, no insulin resistance, that kind of thing. Would you say that could, that, that could be like a good sign of metabolic health too? Absolutely. And the main markers you're looking at is a fasting insulin, fasting triglycerides, fasting glucose. These are all going to be low in someone who's metabolically healthy and has metabolic flexibility. Um, but they're all going to be high in someone who doesn't. You'll see in fasting insulin go up and fasting triglycerides go up. And the last one to go up is fasting glucose. But uh, all of these will be high in someone who's on the diabetes spectrum. Okay. Let's move to this rapid over underrated Q&A regarding metabolic health. So you have to say whether that's underrated or overrated and explain a, sm a small explanation of why you say that it's underrated uh, Okay. So with the first one would be intermittent fasting related to 
metabolic health? Underrated, overrated? Um, right now, it's overrated for sure. Uh, fasting is massively overrated at the moment. Uh, the problem with fasting is that people really push the fasting and they're like fasting, fasting, fasting. They get so hungry that they just immediately super high energy density foods. Everyone's refeeding on like peanut butter and something that's, you know, carb and fat and not necessarily high in protein. Um, and so I see people like lose and then regain the same five pounds over and over and over. You know, you fast for a couple of days uh, and then you just eat a bunch of carbs and fat. And I see people, I, I don't really see this long-term, gradual, sustainable weight loss, or more importantly, fat loss and improvement of body composition with, with extended fasting. Even with intermittent fasting, as long as you're choosing what you eat, it doesn't matter when you eat. Like, you know, if I put you on a desert island and all you've got is salmon and eggs and salad i don't care when you eat like you just you can't overeat you won't get fat you will improve your body composition like it doesn't you could eat 12 tiny meals a day you could eat one giant meal a day you could eat a mega huge meal every two days you could eat every five minutes like i literally don't care if you're controlling what you eat it doesn't really matter when you eat and all those other factors just like fade into the background trying to do the intermittent fasting trick it's really a hack in the modern food environment because we have so many carbs where you're trying to get more fat adapted and get your glycemia under control and not be so reactive to your carb ups and downs and because we have so many refined carbs around us um when doing those is really useful for some people and that's why i kind of like a light intermittent fast of like maybe a 16-8 for most people or something like that. Just so you have a little more time uh, of the day where you're running off of stored body fat instead of having your blood sugar high all the time from all the refined carbs you eat. But for the most part, intermittent fasting, overrated right now. Extended fasting, massively overrated. Uh, two thumbs down. All right. Keto diet. Keto. Okay, so <laughs> this is unfortunately overrated at the moment and the word keto will be dead in a couple more years for sure it's already trending down in google search um the the worst thing that ever happened to low carb was low carb high fat and so if you want to go into a light ketosis by just restricting your carbs that's awesome if you want to be in the deepest ketosis ever and you're tracking your ketones with your ketone meter by eating tons of, you know, refined fat, complete nightmare, not really that great. Um, hugely overrated at the moment. Okay. High protein diets. <laughs> underrated. Underrated. The single biggest lever anyone can pull is the protein percent of their diet. It's bigger than anything else. It's the, it's the biggest rock in the jar. Protein percent is the biggest rock in the jar. Everything else is like pebbles. You know, like macros is more important than micros. Protein is more important than any other factor. This is in the medical literature. Any study you look at, protein percentage of an ad lib diet is the most important thing you can measure. It really outweighs everything else. And so protein is hugely underrated at the moment. I'm not sure why I'm trying to change that. We will. Um, we are we are advocating for that. Okay, micronutrients. Is that overrated or underrated for metabolic health? I think it's underrated, although I do think macronutrients are more important than micronutrients. I also think that if you really look at micros, they follow protein amazingly well. All of your micronutrients track with protein extremely well. They're all associational with protein very tightly. And so anyone who's really targeting protein and high quality proteins is going to have their macros, I mean, their micros completely covered. Yeah. What would you say about like potentially lots of vitamin B, uh, the B complex, would you find them more often than not in vegetables as well? Uh, well, I do think that if you eat like a pure carnivore diet, that's probably suboptimal for things like folate. So yes, I would, I would say that is one more reason to be an omnivore and then you're not going to have to worry about it. So yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Okay. 
fiber, is that overrated or underrated? I think fiber is underrated. I think the low carb community, somehow they went from carbs are bad to all carbs are bad. You should never eat a carb. You should only eat fat and meat. And now I'm a, like a raw carnivore just eating cold cubes of raw pork fat. And so since I never eat carbs because they're all bad, well, then fiber is stupid. Fiber is worthless. Why would I eat fiber? It's probably bad for you. It, so somehow we like threw the baby out with the bathwater there. And so I think fiber is probably under, uh, underrated in the low carb keto community at the moment. But I think in the society at large, fiber is appropriately rated. Let's put it that way. Okay. That's, I, I like that. Collagen supplements. Honestly, I think it's like a massive waste of money. I would basically never buy them, never use them, never recommend them. Wouldn't bother. It's an incomplete protein. It's like BCAAs. I mean, you're kind of just like, I think it's probably a waste of money. Like if I had the, the opportunity to have a collagen supplement versus just any other complete um, high quality protein, I would probably just go for the complete protein. So yeah, overrated. All right. Um, multivitamins, like taking multivitamins. <clears throat> Um, I'm not a huge supplement fan. I basically never take supplements. I rarely recommend them. Uh, I don't think they're hugely helpful. Um, I, if somebody wants to take a multivitamin it just as some sort of like insurance policy, I don't have a problem with it, but I'm never looking at my patients saying, you know what you really need? You need to be taking a multivitamin. <laughs> like I just basically <laughs> never say that. I think it's always better to get these from food. And I think that most supplements exist only to make money for the supplement manufacturer. And it's probably just a joke. So overrated? Overrated, yeah. Okay. Uh, carb distribution. Wait. Or carb was... cycling. Oh, carb cycling. Um, I think that's probably underrated. Okay. I, I think that there's something magical that happens to you during these cycles of uh flipping the metabolic switch and being in ketosis and then being out of it i think this is probably good for you i think that humans had to do this seasonally and based on food availability and i think that it's probably good for you but i have to admit i think it's it's fairly subtle and it's good for you in ways that we haven't really properly quantified so i don't have a lot of scientific evidence to support it but i think carb cycling is probably good and would be the same as like carb distribution, like on a daily basis, you have the same amount of carbohydrates, but now you're sort of distributing it evenly versus just eating one, just all your carbohydrates in just one meal. Well, I think that from an evolutionary perspective, we probably had periods of time where we we're eating way more carbs and periods of time where we we're eating no carbs at all. Um, I also think it might make sense to um, time your carbohydrate, you know, pre-workout, post-workout. Um, it might make sense to eat more carbs after you've depleted muscle glycogen. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why you might want to worry about carb timing. Okay. And so, so I think carb timing... Underrated? underrated. Carb timing is underrated. Okay. Uh, two more. So fat quality. I'm, I'm divided on this. Okay, I think the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is probably something to be concerned about, and that's probably underrated. I think that uh, in extreme low-carb keto circles, there's this massive amount of poofa phobia where, like, all obesity can be blamed on linoleic acid and polyunsaturated fats, and, like, your Ray Pete-type craziness about PUFAs, like, that's extreme. I think that's probably overrated. But I think most people aren't there yet. So uh, I'm divided. Like, it's uh, it's probably underrated. Middle. Yeah, I'm in the middle. It's a little bit of a... Okay. Okay. Plant-based diets. Hugely overrated. Plant-based diets are massively overrated. If I just flipped a switch and tomorrow everyone was vegan, um, everyone would just immediately start gaining weight. The amount of carbohydrate you'd have to eat to get enough protein to not be hungry would go up overnight and everyone would literally get fatter. We would just immediately see even more protein dilution, 
even more fatness over fatness in diabetes. It would be like India where, you know, proteins, they have the lowest meat consumption in the world. Protein percent is like 11% there. And they have a massive diabetes epidemic where diabetes prevalence is way out past the United States and it's a nightmare. Um, and so plant-based diets are hugely overrated. Mm, okay. So that's all the questions I have for you, Ted, today. You did really well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, I wanted to ask you, is there any future projects or anything that you're currently trying to aim for to do over the next few months? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working on like an app that uh, will track macros and look at you know, mostly protein versus calories, protein versus energy. Um, uh, working on some other stuff, uh, maybe kicking around another book idea and working with some other people on basically how to communicate this protein stuff to the masses. So uh, I had some things like in the background, but like most, most of the time I'm just a regular primary care doctor and I'm super busy and actually my practice is close to new patients and I have like way too much stuff going on. <laughs> That's awesome. I am I'm so looking forward to read that new book or just checking out that app that you're going to get. Uh, oh, thank you. Soon. I think that that's going to be really, really cool to see uh, an app that just can sort of scan for a protein and like, put you like a, a red light saying, no, this is very low in protein, swap mm -hmm. it around or something like that. It's cool. There you go. Exactly. Well, Ted, thank you so much for for being here today, spending this time with us. And I will hopefully see you in another Q&A very soon. It sounds good. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any questions or any comments, please comment below. And I'll be sure I'll answer to this as soon as I can.